Uh, I'm really excited to introduce Paula Hawkins this evening. Like many of you, I suspect I devoured this psychological thriller uh, about not what they appear to be lives of three women in suburban London. I was traveling when the book first came out, and since I wanted to read it right away, I got the audio book, uh, which made absorbing this an even more visceral experience because of the the first person narration, it was as if Megan and Rachel and Anna were actually speaking to me. And I can remember on some long winter walks that I took alone in the woods, just being sort of terrified at key moments <laughs> and kind of racing back to the house. Um, so this bestseller is uh, soon going to be a movie starring Emily Blunt. Um, and this book is obviously a huge bestseller. It's also been really popular here at Politics and Prose. I was talking to one of our booksellers this afternoon who told me that it was a book we didn't even have to try to sell. She would see our customers just selling it to one another. Um, so Paul is going to be in conversation with Beth Ann Patrick, a journalist and now regular reviewer for the Washington Post. She's a popular blogger who's also known as the Book Maven and as well as being an author and she has a new book herself coming out this spring called The Books That Changed My Life. So they're going to be in conversation for about 30 minutes and then we're going to open it up to your questions and then after Paula will be signing books right here. So please help me welcome Paula Hawkins. I know um, everyone here. How many of us, raise your hand if you can, if you can how many of us look in windows, especially at night? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and you know, the, uh, there's, a very, there's a very strange house in my neighborhood, and uh, it, it's really creepy and looks like it's, it's sort of uninhabited. And every once in a while, I see a light on. And the other night, I said to my husband as we drove by, oh, look, one of the window shades on the second floor is, is up. What am I going to see? And I looked over, and there was a man in his skivvies clipping his toenails. <laughs> I thought, why can't I be Rachel? Why can't things that are more exciting than this? You know, the fantasies happen to me. So Paula, the first thing I want to ask you is the genesis. Um, I know that you rode commuter trains in London and you were also like all of us looking in windows. And was there a particular moment or day or incident that brought on the idea for the girl on the train? Um, not, not really. What I, I used to, I've done lots of commuting in and out of London, but there was one particular journey where the train did break down all the time, or there were engineering works all the time. <laughs> so, and I Rick used rail. to sit there, yeah, and it was really very close to people's houses, so you could actually just see right into people's living rooms, into their kitchens. And I'd sit there and stare in and really hope that something interesting was going to happen, and I never saw anything even remotely interesting, not even anyone in their skivvies, nothing. <laughs> So I think my imagination started to fill in gaps and I just started wondering what you would do if you know you saw someone stabbing their husband with a kitchen knife or what have you. <laughs> and um, so yeah, it was just that was just the seed was planted. And of course it brought to mind sort of rear window ish kind of ideas of exactly. what kind of witness would you make because you wouldn't really have seen anything, you know, it would be a flash, it would be gone. Well that brings up the idea of the pacing in this book. How many of everyone here tonight has read it already? Oh my goodness, that's fantastic. That's absolutely fantastic. So I'm going to try not to give any spoilers for the people who haven't, but the pacing, as you know, if you have read it, um, takes, it's not just a moment of someone stabbing, it, it spins out. So I wanted to see if you might talk about that for a couple of minutes and then read um, from Rachel's, in Rachel's voice, because I think the idea of the buildup, it's a very slow but very calculated buildup to what happens at the end. So um, how did that come about for you? Well, as I said, I'd initially thought of somebody witnessing an act of violence, but then I actually thought, well, that seemed to close off a lot of avenues that mm -hmm. you could take. So in the end, what she witnesses is something that to anybody else would mean nothing at all. It's just a kiss. It's nothing. It's, it's, right. com it, could, it could mean absolutely nothing at all. But she, because of the story she's built up in her head, because of the fantasies she has, because of her obsession, sees it as this incredibly important moment. And so that opens up the story and then you can go anywhere with it. And what opens up for Rachel is first a fantasy about what this couple's life might be like. Mm. And then after that, 
she sees a few more things happening and spins even more of a tale about them. And the scene you're going to read is Rachel receiving a call and she thinks it's going to be from her ex-husband, but it's actually from her ex-husband's new wife. And they live on the same street as the people whose windows she's been okay. s seeing in. Thank you. Am I in the way of you here? Yeah. That, is that mic on there? Yes, that mic's on. Just a second. Get glasses. I'm blind. <laughs> right, yes. Rachel, as you know, if you've read the book, is she goes into work, but she's not actually going to work because she's lost her job because of her drink problem. So um, instead, she just goes into London and she sits, uh, she's sitting in the park. Can you hear me? Yeah. I must have been there for less than half an hour when my mobile rang. It was Tom again calling from the home phone. I tried to picture him working at his laptop in our sunny kitchen, but the image was spoilt by encroachments from his new life. She would be there somewhere in the background making tea or feeding the little girl, her shadow falling over him. I let the call go to voicemail. I put the phone back in my bag and tried to ignore it. I didn't want to hear any more, not today. Today was awful enough and it wasn't yet 10.30 in the morning. I held out for about three minutes before I retrieved the phone and dialed into voicemail. I braced myself for the agony of hearing his voice, the voice that used to speak to me with laughter and light and now is only used to admonish or console or pity. But it wasn't him. Rachel, it's Anna. I hung up. <laughs> I couldn't breathe and I couldn't stop my brain from racing or my skin from itching, so I got to my feet and walked to the corner shop on Titchfield Street and bought four gin and tonics in cans. And then I went back to my spot in the park. I opened the first one and drank it as fast as I could and then I opened the second. I turned my back to the path so they couldn't see the runners and the mothers with buggies and the tourists. And if I couldn't see them, I could pretend like a child that they couldn't see me. I called my voicemail again. Rachel, it's Anna. Long pause. I need to talk to you about the phone calls. Another long pause. She's talking to me and doing something else. Multitasking the way busy wives and mothers do. Tidying up, loading the washing machine. Look, I know you're having a tough time, she says, as though she has nothing to do with my pain. But you can't call us at night all the time. Her tone is clipped, irritable. It's bad enough that you wake us when you call, but you wake Evie too, and that's just not acceptable. We're struggling to get her to sleep through at the moment. We're struggling to get her to sleep through. We, us, our little family, with our problems and our routines. Bitch. She's a cuckoo laying her egg in my nest. She has taken everything from me. She has taken everything and now she calls me to tell me that my distress is inconvenient for her. I finish the second can and make a start on the third. The blissful rush of alcohol hitting my bloodstream lasts only a few minutes and then I feel sick. I'm going too fast even for me. I need to slow down. If I don't slow down, something bad is going to happen. I'm going to do something I'll regret. I'm going to call her back. I'm going to tell her that I don't care about her and I don't care about her family and I don't care if her child never gets a good night's sleep for the rest of its life. <laughs> I'm going to tell her that the line he used with her, don't expect me to be sane. He used it with me too. When we were first together, he wrote it in a letter to me declaring his undying passion. It's not even his line, he stole it from Henry Miller. <laughs> Everything she has is second-hand. I want to know how that makes her feel. I want to call her back and ask her, what does it feel like, Anna, to live in my house, surrounded by the furniture I bought to sleep in the bed that I shared with him for years? I still find it extraordinary that they chose to stay there, in that house, in my house. I was the one who insisted we buy it, despite its location. I liked being down there on the tracks. I liked watching the trains go by. I enjoyed the sound of them. Not the scream of an intercity express, but the old-fashioned trundling of ancient rolling stock. Tom told me it won't always be like this. They'll eventually upgrade the line and then it will be the fast trains screaming past. But I couldn't believe it would actually ever happen. I would have stayed there. I would have bought him out if I'd had the money. I didn't, though, and we couldn't find a buyer at a decent price when we divorced. So instead he bought me out and he said he'd stay on until he found a buyer. 
but he never did. And he moved her in, and she loved the house like I did, and they decided to stay. She must be very secure in herself, I suppose, in them, for it not to bother her to walk where another woman has walked before. She obviously doesn't think of me as a threat. I think about Ted Hughes moving Asia Wevel into the home he'd shared with Plath, of her wearing Sylvia's clothes, brushing her hair with the same brush. I want to ring Anna up and remind her that Asia ended up with her head in the oven, just like Sylvia did. done to a turn. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I know one of the things that at least I'm fascinated by, and I think other readers are fascinated by, is the idea of gin and tonic in cans. <laughs> we, we don't have that, do we? <laughs> wouldn't, it be, wouldn't it be nice? That sounds like, do they taste nice? I have to say that this is the question I'm asked more than any other question. <laughs> In the United States. <laughs> can you really get gin tonic in a can? And you can really get gin tonic in a can, and I don't recommend it. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it is for desperation drinking. If you, if, well, you, you know, know you, mean, if, you, if you're not desperate, you go to a bar and have a bar and make you a nice <laughs> one with a slice of lemon. Yeah, I, I highly recommend last year I actually got my husband in a gin advent calendar. <laughs> which was very very popular gift. I mean, we are a bit, we're a bit obsessed, I think, here in the states with these things. Okay. But um, I wanted to go from that to writing about addiction, and um, not just the question of Rachel and her addiction and whether or not she gets better or worse, but also who has to deal with the fallout. Because um, you had to have a character like Kath, didn't you? Because if not, if there were no Kath, then Rachel couldn't go on with her, you know, obsession and her stalking and, and the things that she is so obsessed with in, in this case. I think without, um, yes, without the, the roommate, without Kathy, she would have, she would have fallen even further. Mm -hmm. Because she has to keep up this pretense that, that because she has to otherwise she would just be sitting there drinking all day right so um and yes and kathy tries to help her and tries to make things better but actually isn't really committed enough to it right i mean because she doesn't have that vested interest she's just a roommate she's she, so um yeah but she is the one who's kind of suffers with it um but is obviously coming to the end of her tether and i think had rachel left then we would have really seen her fall apart well, it, absolutely A another thing that ties the three voices together is um how do I, uh, children, fertility, um, the idea of one, you know, one woman has a child, one woman has lost a child, one woman has not been able to have any. And again, I'm not naming them just in case you haven't read it. But that is a very interesting and powerful subtext for a lot of the, the rage that goes on. And, and Rachel's very funny. I mean, you're, uh, you're a very funny writer, but Rachel, you know, as a character is, um, you know, really got this dark humor, but it masks um, a great deal of anger yeah I mean I think what that sort of came about ad, while I was writing it I'd I'd come up with Rachel and I knew she was she was an alcoholic who had um, this memory loss issue but then I started to think to myself well okay how did she get there what could have happened to her that she has sunk so low so early in life so she's lost her, her marriage and perhaps this is because of the strain that infertility put on their marriage mm -hmm. that it made her depressed that she couldn't have a child and then I started thinking, you know, these women are all early 30s-ish. That's an, an age at which issues around motherhood become, are pushed to the fore. Often, not necessarily, you don't necessarily want them to be pushed to the fore, but your mother-in-law is asking you questions, or, you know, your, all your friends start having babies, or the newspapers are telling you not to leave it too late. And there's, so it becomes this very, th this pressure builds up. And I think, well, these, decisions are very personal and ought to remain very personal they become public property and everyone thinks they have a right to give you their opinion on your own fertility um, and I think that kind of um, that can cause women to be quite defensive which means they sort of start judging each other's choices which is exactly what they're doing in this book you know they're all looking at each other and they've sort of internalized those slightly misogynist social judgments and they're turning them on each other. Well, and that's exactly what um, Rachel says at one point. I'm not sure. I think this is page 79. I'm not beautiful, and I can't have kids, so what does that make me? Worthless. 
And so there's a real thread running through this. We have the problem of violence, and we know it's male violence, but you know it, we don't know who. Um, but it's also, as you said, the women judging each other and playing against each other when they might be able to um, multiply and conquer instead of divide and conquer. Yeah, and I think hopefully over the course of the book we see those those judgments start to be broken down and they start to see through what's actually going on here and there is some sense of solidarity um, <laughs> sort of tor towards the end. Well, uh, you know, not everything was going to turn out rosy for this lot, obviously, but um, yeah, I mean, at least we, they have seen through the you know they are they they are breaking down these judgments that's was the thing that was well, important and one of the things you said in an interview that i loved is uh, you like to think about and write about the nasty little things people do to each other and we often think that women don't do nasty things we think <laughs> right <laughs> well, I, maybe 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 that's just me uh, but <laughs> we, we you know we tend to think of the fairer sex or we have tended um, to think of it that way but this is a book in which women are really doing nasty little things as well. It may not be um, things that are quite as physically, um, what's the word I'm trying to look for, uh, aggressive, but they're still. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not very gender essentialist about this. I think, you know, women can be, I mean, obviously women don't statistically tend to commit as much violence, but in any case, yes, they are doing horrible things to each other. There is emotional manipulation going on. There are all sorts of betrayals. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, I think it's weird to, to, to to assume that women are just are nice. In fact, I find that kind of a weird, you know, slightly sexist assumption that women are <laughs> fundamentally better. It, it in is, some way. and I have been carefully taught for um, too too long about that. We are not very nice. Um, but uh, it, the, the other thing that that brings up for me is the idea of community versus privacy, which is something that you really do explore in this book. You know, the women could band together at this time or that time or not. People in the neighborhood might notice things or not. Mm. Etc. And so, um, when you're riding a train and looking in the same window, you know, evening after evening, you, like Rachel does, can get up, caught up with the idea that perhaps you're part of someone's life, mm. and um, that. But that's really a private life that's taking, even if it's right off of the tracks. Yeah, I think what you have with Rachel is that she's she's incredibly lonely and feels an outsider. And so she's so desperate to make a connection with somebody. She's seeing connections where they don't exist. Um, I moved from Africa to London when I was 17 and I was completely, I didn't know anyone and it was awful and I hated it. And I remember that feeling of sitting on trains and looking at, um, you know, there'd be a balcony with like little lights strung up and you were just imagining the parties that people were having and everyone else was having a much better time than me and it was terrible and <laughs> there was that yeah that, that <laughs> yeah well now we do it on Facebook <laughs> but that that kind of yearning that desperation to make a connection you can imagine in somebody as troubled and as and with her addiction problems that they would go beyond just the yearning for the connection yeah. and actually try and force the connection mm -hmm. which is what she ultimately does yeah, boy, and, and does she. Um, the complicity that uh, happens in this book, and again, I'm trying to touch lightly on that because I don't want to talk about the ending for those who haven't read it, but there is um, this idea that there's strength in numbers, perhaps. I don't know if there's strength in, in two women you know, conquering something. Is there a, a sort of idea that... Um, the women at the end being complicit in something? Um, well, they are tied together yeah. in a certain way. Um, uh, in a way, I mean, it's not, it's not necessar necessarily a complicity. Mm -hmm. It's more of a kind of a, a, a bargain that they strike, right. um, which means that they are, yes, tied together and both of their fates are kind of dependent on the other woman and the other woman's silence, perhaps. Do you know what happens to them? Have you talked about that? Oh, what, in, what, in the future? What, yeah, in the future. No, I don't know. No. I think I'm, I'm, once I've written a book, or once I've, I, I tend to put them aside, um, perhaps I would might return to them sometime in the future, but for the moment, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're gone. Well, I know, one of the most, um, I think, important things uh, about this book, besides the fact that it's so good and so compelling, is that you had written several books and published things that didn't really feel like your own. Uh, yeah, I was, um, 
I was commissioned to write a romantic fiction, uh, sort of romantic comedy thing, which I wrote under a pseudonym. I did four of those. And, um, you know, they were fun, and I, 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 I enjoyed some of them to some degree, but they never felt right. They never felt as though they came from me, and um, they just kept getting darker and darker. And... <laughs> more and more terrible things kept happening to everybody in them <laughs> and finally yeah the last one just really didn't do well at all um and i think there was this big sort of i don't i'm not saying they were terrible books but i think there was a big sort of um sort of mismatch between the kind of sparkly covers they had and the death and destruction that was going on inside so they it, it was not my genre it's it really was writerly wasn't. development <laughs> exactly it was it was very helpful well, you know, one of the reasons I'm asking that is because um, Megan's story, in and of itself, to me, was a novel. I wanted to know more about Mac. I wanted to know more about Libby. I wanted to know more about that, you know, sort of tip that they, they or squat that they lived in. It was just an amazing, uh, it, it's, it's such a, a, more of a slender part of the narrative, but it was really well wrought. Um, Thank you, and I think actually I can imagine returning to that story. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if I could now because you know how it ends. But um, uh, <laughs> but yeah, there is a lot in that, and I can see where that you know I can I it was very well sort of finished in my head. I can kind of see where they were, and yeah. Oh, I might have to ask her that afterwards. <laughs> but I, we have a few minutes left before I turn it over to all of you, and so I want you to tell us. Well, first of all, very very exciting news for the girl on the train. Many of you probably know already is that it's in production as a major motion picture starring Emily Blunt, and uh, Paula is going to be in New York this next week as production begins. Correct. I am, yes. And uh, can you tell us anything else about casting? Um, uh, yeah, Anna is um, an actress called Rebecca Ferguson, who was in the latest Mission Impossible film. I don't know if any of you have seen that, but the girl in that is Anna. Megan is an actress called Hayley Bennett, who's not especially well known, but um, I, I haven't seen her in anything. She's very beautiful. She, physically, she's perfect. A couple of big male names. Jared Leto is... I keep getting muddled up with which one is which, but anyway, Jared Leto and Justin Theroux are the men. And an actor, and a Venezuelan actor called Edgar Ramirez will be Dr. Abdi, the therapist. We haven't Dr. even Abdi. talked about Kamal. I know, it's so much, so much. And along with that, um, to talk about the, the movie before we turn things over, I also want to talk about your next book because mm. it's coming out next year, correct? Well, Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, things haven't gone quite as smoothly as hoped on that front. I've been a bit distracted this year. <laughs> um, I'm writing. I'm in the middle of it. Um, it's another psychological thriller. It's set, this time it's set in some sort of, fi it's a fictional town in the north of England, sort of near the Scottish borders, dark and grim and miserable. Um, and it centers on a relationship between sisters. Um, so again, I'm looking at women's relationships to each other. Um, and um, again, memory plays an important part because it's ha all about the memories we have from childhood and how they go to make up who we are, the sort of stories we tell about ourselves and our families and how sometimes those stories aren't actually true. I don't know if this has ever happened to you when you've, you, you can clearly remember a day at the beach or something and you'll be talking to your parents about it and they'll go, no, you weren't actually there. You've seen a <laughs> photograph of it. You've just seen a picture and you could have sworn you were there. So it's, I mean, that's a trivial example, but it's those kind of things that go in, that become myths in your mind, you know. Oh, so it's all about that kind of Do you have a title? I do, but I'm not sure you that it might not change, so I'm not telling you. you don't have no, absolutely not. No, this is this is this is fascinating. So, uh, for you to ask questions, we'd like to ask if you would come to a microphone right over here. So, line up, get ready. Is there another one? Oh, right over here as well. So, um, we're ready for whatever you'd like to ask. I'm sure that I, don't be shy. Don't be shy. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll just keep asking things. <laughs> Anyone's favorite moment in The Girl on the Train? They are very shy. Awfully shy, my goodness. Oh, here we go, breaking the ice. Are you writing the script for the movie? No, I, I didn't work on it. Um, it was, I've never written for film. I don't know anything about writing for film, so I thought it was probably better that I left it to the professionals. Thank you. So, 
as you were reading, you got a lot of laughs from the audience. Did did you want this to be a funny book? <laughs> I, I don't think of it as especially funny. Um, yeah. I mean, there are, it has its moments. I think that there's some black humor, but um, no, it's not. It's not really laugh a minute. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in this 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 cast of characters, did you did you have a favorite? Um, <laughs> they're they're not you know particularly likable. I just wondered if no. you had a favorite. Rachel is the one I know the best. I lived with her longest because I that was the character. I'd, I'd come up with the, that character in, in the context of another story I'd thought about. Um, so to me, she I know her the best, and I care about her, and I feel sorry for her. And I think that although she's not behaving particularly well at this point, I don't think that she's a bad person. I think she's just a very messed up and lonely and vulnerable person. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, uh, one of the things I saw that Anna said is the truth is I never felt bad for Rachel, even before I found out about her drinking and how difficult she was, how she was making his life a misery. She just wasn't real to me. In any way, I was enjoying myself too much. Being the other woman is a huge turn on. There's no point denying it. You're the one he can't help but betray his wife for, even though he loves her. That's just how irresistible you are. And I, I loved that because I thought um, each of these women has dealt with different shades of, sorry, I'm using shades of, um, different, different shades of, 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 of betrayal and love and problems and, and that sort of thing. And um, I was wondering if there was a reason for Anna and Megan to look so much alike. Was it for the memories and the blackouts, or was it for a different reason? Well, I mean, yeah, that's partly, it's, it, that was useful for me to have them to look si look similar. It also explains why perhaps the, they would be, attra um, you know, be attractive to the, se to the same men. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think that, that, that quote from Anna, Anna is just brutally honest. She kind of just says everything that, uh, well, in, in her in her internal monologue is <laughs> brutally honest and that's yes. how she feels about it. And I think that's a perfectly understandable way to feel about things. It's not very nice, but you no, know, but the, nice you're, you're deep, things. yeah, that's the way people think. <laughs> right here. I have to talk into this. Yes, um, please. Please. I have two questions that are sort of about the sort of outsides of, of the business. When you're on the set or doing production next week, what does that mean? What do people do if you're not Oh, I know. I'm it. just. I'm not actually involved. I might go and visit, but it's got. I'm not involved in the actual. So you just sort of stand there and see what's going on. Yeah, I assume so. If they allow me to 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 come on. <laughs> and and the second question is also sort of about the business. Is um. So now you're an expert in dysfunctional women and thrillers. Is is that what sort of everyone expects you to do next? Is there pressure from your publisher? Do that again. That was great. I, I don't um, know how it works. <laughs> no, there is. I mean. There isn't really pressure, but because I actually chose, have chosen to write another book about dysfunctional, dysfunctional women in a thriller <laughs> setting. So I think that's maybe what interests me. Uh, they haven't said, um, you know, yes, you must continue to do more of the same. Perhaps they would later on if I suddenly say, oh, actually, I'm going to write a historical romance or something. <laughs> they might be a bit like, really? But um, <laughs> so, n so far, no, I'm not being pressured by anyone else to, to do anything. But I can imagine a circumstance in which that might happen, yeah. Anyone? Anyone? Dust? <laughs> Are any of the characters in your book based on people that you know, whether or not you like them? <laughs> um, no, not really. I mean, there there are aspects of them that are perhaps, you know, borrowed from people. Um, and some aspects that come from me, you know, but a lot of it is just pure imagination. Um, my I. I've got a really good friend called Kate, to whom the book is dedicated, actually. And she, when she first read it, she was like, oh my god, am I Kathy?" <laughs> 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 but she isn't. Well, once you sell that script to Hollywood, that's out of your hands forever. Uh, yep. One of your great underappreciated writers in Great Britain is Ruth Rendell. Is she any influence on you at all? Um, do you know, I haven't read a huge amount of her. I used to love the TV adaptations, but yeah, she's, I mean, I'm, I'm not a huge consumer of police procedural, but yeah, she is, she's a wonderful writer, a really and wonderful writer. You know, really 
people go really crazy right in the middle yeah. of the story and uh, it's it's real it's true the barbara vine especially oh, yeah. uh, you know but that's yeah, i think i've read more of her because that's more on the sort of psychological thriller end as the barbara vine which they're very clever but that, um, there's a good follow-up to that and i won't forget you but it's just you said you don't read a great deal of procedural or mysteries while you're writing no not when i'm writing i tend to to try and read other things in case you know you, you start to worry that other people's plots or voices will contaminate or inf over influence <laughs> Uh, yours is a book about women that could have only been written by a woman. Uh, how do you get into the psyche of men when you're writing about male characters? And the second question, which is vaguely related, is how difficult is it to write about sex? Well, um, now we're cooking. Um, <laughs> I think in this book, actually, I managed, I mean, it is so much about the women and you do, do only hear the women's voices. So I kind of steered clear of too, having to delve too much into the men's heads. Uh, the next book, I am going to try to do it more. So, I mean, this will be this will be a new departure for me. There are some people who managed to do that gender swap, literary gender swap very, very well. Um, it, I'm, I'm not sure that I will be able to do it, but um, as for the sex writing, there, there is very little sex in this book. There isn't a huge amount in the next one, I don't think. Well, not, certainly not explicit. The thing that I have when I'm, ri sort of, I'm writing these things is I think, oh, God, my mother's going to see this. <laughs> <laughs> and so that always makes me kind of pull back from it. I, I, I do think, actually, that sex writing is very difficult to do well in any case. Male or female. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Hi. I think you said that you grew up in Africa. And um, would you mind saying where that was? Zimbabwe. And um, what kind of impact do you think that's made on your um, ability to observe or uh, feeling apart from or part of? Um, what kind of impact has that mm. made on your writing? Well, I mean, it certainly the the move from Zimbabwe to London did. I was. I did have that real outsider's feeling, and I think people who feel like outsiders do sort of sit back and watch a bit more. So you you, you are more sort of observational. Um, but um, also, when I was when I was in Zimbabwe, my my father he's an academic, but he also um, wrote for the newspapers. So we had we used to have journalists coming to stay all the time who always had exciting stories about being kidnapped and nearly blown up and whatnot. So that was the thing that really kind of got me interested in journalism, which is where my sort of writing career started was as a journalist. So so yeah, I do credit it with that. I know that uh, Paula has said that the London climate actually suits her better. It does. <laughs> I'm not a sun worshiper, yeah, I like dreary. I like rain. <laughs> I wonder if you could tell us more about what draws you to the darker themes. It's really difficult to explain that because I, I, you know, I had a really happy childhood and my parents were really happy and nothing terrible has really ever happened to me, Touchwood. Um, so I just, some of us, I think, are just drawn to those sorts of things. I'm the kind of person who reads, you know, you read a terrible thing in the newspaper about some ostensibly normal people who've ended up doing the most dreadful things to each other. And I can't help but wonder, like, how on earth did that happen? And sort of trying to figure out how it is that people get to that point that they are doing these awful things to each other. It, I just find it fascinating. I just find the psychology of it all fascinating. But I can't ex tell you why. <laughs> it's obviously something deeply wrong with me. Yes, that's clearly what I need. Yeah. The women are the central characters, but I found the doctor a very interesting, complex Thank you. character. <laughs> Could you say something about his development and uh, what the background on that was? Well. He actually, I think he initially started out as having more of a, a role, um, more of as a, as a suspect. Um, but he was, he's, he ends up being really Megan's confessor, the one to whom she can tell everything. And although he does perhaps overstep some bounds in, in therapy terms, he is a good man. I think he does genuinely care about her and does genuinely want to do the right thing. So I think he's, he's probably the closest we have to an actually a good person in the book. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm fond of him. I, I could bring him back. <laughs> like that. Questions, questions? Going once, going twice, here we go. <laughs> So I'm curious, did the book change or did the story change much from when you started writing it 
to the end or did you kind of conceptualize the whole thing? Um, I knew where I was going. I knew who'd done it. I knew kind of kind of how I was going to get there. So I had the architecture of it set out. But yeah, things did change. Things, twists suggest themselves to you. Developments suggest themselves to you. And that's, I think, the the fun bit of the whole thing is when things emerge as you're going along. But I'm not the sort of person who could just sit down and see where it takes me because with a thriller I'd be terrified that I'd get sort of three quarters of the way in and realize that it doesn't work and then you've yeah. wasted you know a year of your life. How long did it take you to write it? It took me a year. Yeah. Very impressive. <laughs> yeah I basically didn't do anything else that year it was quite of a it was an <laughs> obsessive um, experience. Thank you. Thanks. Turned out very well. <laughs> yes. Um, I've I've heard of some comparisons um, of your book to another bestseller, Gone Girl, and just wondering if you have any thoughts on that, or <laughs> if you've read it. Or I I loved it. I really liked that book. Um, I can't remember when I read it. Um, it it certainly wasn't in my head when I was writing. I actually think the books are very different. I mean, there's there's the obvious central um, you know protagonist who's unreliable and difficult, um, but they couldn't be more different really. Amy Dunn is a manipulative sociopath and Rachel is just a mess who isn't in control of anything. Um, so apart from that I don't you know I just I just don't see them as particularly similar but I love that book and I thought Amy was a wonderful character and I was rooting for her all the way through even when she was killing people I loved her. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm go Amy. Amy Dunn for president. <laughs> I think we have time for one or two more questions. If anyone is tempted, again, don't be shy. I think we can go to the signing, yes. Thank you all so much for Thank being you. here. Thank you, Paula. <laughs>